Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's MTV Summer School lecture, uh, second lecture of the day, I suppose. Uh, Michael Hua gave an excellent overview of Monte Carlo this morning, so I am going to I'll continue uh, sort of where he left off. So um, for those of you that don't know me, I am Sean Clark. I'm a research faculty at the University of Michigan. Um, also the Associate Director for the Consortium for Monitoring Technology and Verification. Um, and the plan here is I've got about 30 slides I'm going to go through, so it should take about 40 minutes. Uh, we'll have time for questions at the end. If you have questions, um, you can type them in the chat or you can speak up using the raise your hand feature and then we'll uh, handle it that way. So with that, I will go ahead and get started. So just a bit of a, of a recap, um, in case some folks missed the lecture this morning, I wanna just give a couple slides of introduction about uh, what is Monte Carlo and kind of the origins of the method. So um, the method itself dates back to the Manhattan Project. So in the mid 1940s, um, of course, the, a lot of the focus at that time was on the, on the weapons program and the Manhattan Project. And there was a proposal at Los Alamos National Lab to use their then supercomputer, which was known as um, ENIAC, for the calculations that were needed to, to design these early nuclear weapons. The photos you see here on the slide, these, these three gentlemen are um, widely regarded as the, the fathers of the Monte Carlo method. Uh, Ulam Metropolis and von Neumann. And Stan Ulam was the first to suggest using this machine for what he called at the time a method for statistical trial of statistical trials, which um, then became the Monte Carlo method as we know it today. Um, Nick Metropolis was the one who first suggested that name Monte Carlo, and then von Neumann was sort of the father of the Monte Carlo code, which um, a lot of us now know as MCNP, which is the, the code that comes out of Los Alamos, but um, there are many codes around the world that perform uh, particle transport and other calculations using the Monte Carlo method. So what exactly is the Monte Carlo method? The word Monte Carlo gets used a lot um, by scientists and engineers, but um, it's not always obvious or it's difficult to find a, a definition that's, that's concise. In fact, there's a, a quote here on the slide from a, a Monte Carlo textbook that says, it's difficult to construct the definition which characterizes the Monte Carlo method accurately, completely, and concisely, but can be safely said as a method with some sort of random sampling. So now we can see here that random sampling is at the key of any Monte Carlo calculation. And I know that um, Mike covered that this morning in a lot of detail, and I'll, I'll be going over that a little bit again this afternoon. If we take a survey of, of common uh, textbooks or experts in the field, we can find a, a variety, a whole slew of definitions about the Monte Carlo method, and you can see them uh, listed here on the slide. And, um, you know, there are similarities, there are differences, but um, the main thread that we can pull out of these, of these uh, different definitions is, is the word random. So you can see that um, while these uh, definitions do have differences, they all, nearly all of them, use the word random. Uh, I think this Theorist that and Martin is the only uh, definition of the list here that does not uh, cite the word uh, random in this definition. But uh, suffice to say, the Monte Carlo method uh, at its core uh, involves some type of random sampling. And we're using that random sampling to um, model some physical process. Um, and, and then, you know, random numbers are, again, needed for any Monte Carlo calculation, but true random numbers are uh, difficult to come across. You know, there are certain primitive random number generators like rolling a die, for example, um, but simple, simply rolling a die is not uh, sufficient to perform large scale Monte Carlo calculations. You, you need um, a large string of reproducible uh, numbers that are in some sense random. And that's where the phrase pseudo random numbers uh, comes in. So um, Monte Carlo codes, Monte Carlo calculations use a sequence of numbers called pseudo random numbers. They're called pseudo because they're not truly random. Uh, pseudo random numbers are a string of numbers in which any number depends mathematically on the previous number in the string. So there is some uh, dependence there, but it's a very loose dependence. And uh, furthermore, the string can 
can go on for a very long, a very long period before it begins to repeat itself. And those are a couple of the characteristics of a good pseudo random number generator. You want um, numbers that are, are randomly distributed in that, in that sense, and also have a very long period because um, to do a true radiation transport calculation, you can, you can uh, find yourself using billions or hundreds of billions of random numbers. So um, we need a, a string that we can reliably uh, treat as truly random. Now, the other key about these random numbers is that they are, of course, positive and real. And they're, um, when we talk about random sampling, we're always assuming that these numbers are distributed on the interval between 0 and 1. Okay. So with that uh, background, I'm going to get into what I have planned for today. So I want to talk about hey, Monte Carlo, and I want to talk about it in uh, the context of uh, a simple Monte Carlo transport problem. So I want to walk through uh, sort of the life of a neutron and talk about how through Monte Carlo we can um, simulate that neutron lifetime or random walk as it's commonly called. Um, talk about the different physics laws that we use to do that and then talk about the ways that we um, use Monte Carlo, PDFs and CDFs, to um, sample from those distributions. So that's going to be kind of the second and third point here, analog simulation and generation of histories. And then I'm going to end with uh, a description of how do we actually compute quantities of interest from Monte Carlo. So things like flux or um, reaction rates or particle current, things like that. And in Monte Carlo jargon, those are typically called tallies. So um, we're going to walk through a neutron random walk, talk a little bit about tallies, and that should take us to time. So. I want to consider uh, a 1D problem. So we're going to make this as simple as possible so that we can um, write out simple expression, the analytic expressions to, to do this transport. Um, we're going to consider a, a particle. In this case, we can think of it as a neutron that's incident on some slab. Um, it's a 1D slab that you can think of it as infinite in the other directions. And we can we understand this slab as having um, cross sections available for both scattering and absorption. Um, the other thing we're going to do is we're going to assume that all scattering is isotropic and the, these scattering events occur uh, without loss or gain of particle energy, which of course is not physical, um, but it makes things a lot simpler when we, when we start trying to think about um, modeling this random walk. And the, the goal before us is to determine the probabilities that these neutrons either transmit through the slab, are absorbed within the slab, or reflect uh, back out the front face of the slab. So this is just a graphical uh, representation of, of what I was talking about. So uh, we have our, our neutron source here on the left uh, in the green arrow incident on the slab. And that neutron can end its life in one of three ways for purposes of our simulation. Um, the first way is it can transmit. It can make it all the way through the slab as shown by the green arrow. It can get absorbed somewhere in the slab shown by the red um, kind of dot here at the end, or it can reflect out the front edge of the slab. So for our case, we want to um, simulate the neutrons random walk and then tally uh, the occurrence of these three neutron fates. Just a bit of definition. So what do we mean by a random walk? So um, neutrons, when they move through a medium, the, their path in any medium is generally referred to as a random walk in that medium. Um, it's called a random walk because it's every step along that path is random. Um, the direction that it scatters, the energy that it can lose, the interaction type that it has all along the way can be considered random. And we'll, we'll talk about that as we walk through this process. Um, you could think of the random walk as a, as a collection of variables. So the neutron starts at, at in one state, here R1, E1, omega 1, and then through whatever interaction, it, it, it transfers to another state, R2, E2, omega 2, so on and so forth. So that collection of states that a neutron has in its lifetime is what we call the random walk. The second bit of definition is solid angle. So in this case, uh, we're going to use the letter big omega to denote the a direction in three-dimensional space, and we're going to call that um, direction solid angle. Okay, so how do we actually generate this, this random walk? So 
Um, at the beginning of its life, there's a finite probability that the particle is born with any certain number of properties. So, you know, where it's born, which direction is it's traveling, how much energy does it has, does it have? Um, those are all uh, properties of that particle, and they can all be um, thought to be random with some finite probability. Once the particle is born, the neutron will travel some distance, uh, and that distance it travels between its its birth position and its first collision are uh, considered to be random. Once the neutron travels that distance, the a collision will take place, presumably, unless that first collision actually takes it out of the slab, which is possible. Um, but assuming it, it has a collision, the type of collision it has is also random. So it can be, in our case, it can be a scatter or it can be an absorption. In real life, there's many other possibilities. You can have um, n 2 n reactions, you can have inelastic scatter, you can have fission, um, all these different kind of reactions. And those are sampled randomly using cross-section data. If the collision is an absorption type, the a secondary particle may or may not appear. So if it's fission, for example, um, we may produce a bunch of secondary particles. And those uh, particles also have, have properties that are um, random. And then we've talked about, um, in our case, the three possibilities that, that this random walk ends in are going to be absorption, leakage, or um, transmission, or reflection, sorry, transmission or reflection. So in a random walk, there are um, six coordinates that we need to keep track of. Uh, the position of the particle, so if it's 3D, it's X, Y, and Z. Um, the direction of the particle's travel, which is big omega, and we can express that in terms of two angles, theta and phi. And the, the sixth parameter is the particle's energy. So um, the first thing that one needs to do is, is sample the particle's source. So what's typically done in uh, Monte Carlo codes, not always, but um, typically it's convenient to assume that the source properties are separable. So Q is, is the letter commonly used to denote a particle source. And our particle source is a function of position, direction, and energy. And we're, we're going to make the assumption that those three variables, position, direction, and energy, are separable, meaning that um, we can sample one without regard to the other. Um, and this, that allows us to sample these things independently and, and therefore define our source. Um, the other thing that, that needs to be done when the source is sampled is, is normalization. So I think Mike touched on this this morning, but um, the source needs to be normalized to one, meaning it's a probability. So you need to make a PDF out of any type of variable that um, is being sampled in uh, Monte Carlo. Uh, PDF means um, positive definite and the integral is one, meaning it's something has to happen. It's a probability. If these conditions are not met, then you can normalize it and um, ensure that it is in fact a probability. Okay, so let's consider first the particle position. So, um, you know, commonly in nuclear engineering, we, we simulate things that are point sources. Uh, point sources are trivial, uh, and, and point source situation, all one has to do is define um, the point where the source is born. So it's not that interesting in terms of a, in terms of a sampling calculation. But um, for the, we should mention it. So basically, it's, it can be defined by direct assignment. So you would just say, this particle is born at this position, x or r in this case. Um, and every source event from every history is going to be born at that position. That's a perfectly valid and very common way to specify a source in a Monte Carlo calculation. Um, but what if we want to do something a little bit more um, elaborate? So the second example here on the slide is if one has a, a source that's distributed uniformly along a straight line, so some type of line source. So the position is no longer constant. We're going to have our source distribution Q, which is a function of, we're calling it L in this case, where um, that particle can be born anywhere along that straight line. And we need a way to sample using random variable where along that line the source uh, position is located. So uh, we start with our, our PDF here, P of LDL, it needs to be normalized. So one over L takes care of that normalization. So with the, with the PDF in place, uh, we can go down here to the bottom and use the inverse transform method. So you take uh, the integral of your PDF from 
the lower bound, which in this case is zero because we're talking about space, lower bound of zero, the upper bound of L, the variable L from L, uh, DL prime. And you solve that and you set it equal to any random number. In this case, the random number is being denoted as the Greek, Greek letter Xi, which is the uh, common notation that's used. So by solving this integral and then solving the equation for L or R, uh, we can come up with an expression for a position R2 uh, as a function of R1. So we're assuming we know R1 and we're trying to define where along the line the source gets born. So by sampling a single, by yeah, sampling a single random number Xi, we can calculate R2. And because our, our random number Xi is uniformly distributed and random, um, this expression will produce a set of positions that is also uniformly distributed and random along the straight line. You can do similar calculation for area type sources. So um, I said our example was 1D, but just to kind of give you a flavor for what you can do, um, you can consider a source that's born over a rectangular area or a circular area. Um, in this case, because it's a 2D uh, distribution, uh, one needs to uh, use two random numbers to sample at that position. Uh, in the case of the box here on the left, or right on the left, you need one random variable to sample the X position, one random variable to sample the Y position. For the circular area, um, again, two random numbers are needed. One random number to sample the R, the radius position, and one random number to sample the angle. So here we're using um, central coordinates to define this circular area. So we've got an expression here on the slide that to show you how to um, do the sampling for the rectangular type. And this is very similar to the, the line source example that we just showed, um, where for the x distribution, your PDF is p of x dx normalized by uh, 1 over a, which is the length. And when you, when you solve that CDF, instead of equal to random number, you can, you can arrive at this expression for the x position, which is um, the x position randomly sampled is the random number xi multiplied by the length of that side a, assuming that the box corner is at the origin zero. Same exact logic applies for the y direction. Um, whenever you, if you read Monte Carlo textbooks, the first random number is always xi, second random number is always eta, not really sure why. Um, but Xi and Eta are two independently sampled random numbers. So you, one random number gets sampled to generate the X position multiplied by A. Second random number is sampled to get the Y position by multiplying it by the Y side B. The um, cylindrical coordinates is, is uh, shown here on this slide. And here we need to sample um, an angle, Phi that can be uniformly distributed between zero and two pi. This is analogous to this, the example we just showed uh, with the um, sides of the square. So because we want uniform on two pi, you just arrive at um, psi equals two pi times, or phi equals two pi times phi. The radius is a little bit more, uh, a little more difficult because of the, the um, two pi r dr unit area for cylindrical coordinates. So when you define your PDF P of RDR, um, you have to take into account that volumetric element, the area element um, as two pi RDR in the normalization. And when you do that properly, you can arrive at the expression of the sampled radius as the square root of your random number times the um, radius of the disk over which you want to sample. So again, because this is a 2D distribution that we're trying to uh, sample here, we need two random numbers. First one, psi multiplied by two pi gives us the angle. Second number, eta, whose square root times um, the total radius gives us the radius of that position. And these uh, approaches can be used as to sample uniformly in area over a box or a circle um, for the source of our particle transport. A word about energy. Um, energy is, is kind of a broad topic because de depending on the source, that um, you're trying to model in your, in your Monte Carlo. Um, with that, that'll kind of define how the source energy gets sampled. So of course, the simplest case is a minor energetic source. So um, that's a situation where um, you would just assign the energy to you know, a certain value. Um, 
This, the second example would be, for example, a gamma ray source that maybe emits photons of multiple discrete energies. So in that case, it would be a kind of a discrete sampling. So example, a common example is always cobalt 60, which has two discrete decay emissions. And, and in that case, you would want the source to sample from one of those two energies, 1173, 1332, with, um, in that case, an even probability. The third example is a continuous spectrum, so something like a watt spectrum, a fission spectrum, uh, which is a continuum. That's a mathematical function um, that can be sampled from. Um, so these are all ways that uh, you can kind of sample energy of the source. I'm not going to go through an inverse uh, transform type approach for them because it really depends on the type of source that you're considering, but um, the same approach would apply if you had a mathematical function that you needed to invert, or in the top two cases, if you just need to, to assign either a certain fixed variable or um, sample from two discrete values. The next thing, so we have our source position, whether it's a fixed point or a line source or an area distribution, um, we're gonna assume we have that. So we know position and we know energy because we, we have either a fixed value or we have a set of values that we're gonna sample from. So the, the next uh, variable that we need, the final variable we need for our source is the direction. So we know where the particle is born, we know what its energy is, which direction is it gonna be traveling in. In this case, we're gonna use this solid angle definition omega that I showed in the earlier slides. And if you remember, uh, omega is a function of two other angles, theta and phi. And um, because it's solid angle, it covers four pi. So the, the, the four pi, is our normalization factor here for omega. So here on the top line, you can, you can see the uh, PDF that we're gonna be working from. So P omega D omega, uh, it's, it's D omega over four pi because of our normalization. And then if you consider the solid angle element D omega, it can be written as sine theta D theta D phi. And again, the one over four pi stays in the denominator because of the normalization. So at this point, um, we're going to need two random variables to sample our two uh, subangles theta and phi. So it's convenient to uh, separate the this PDF into two contributions. So one contribution for theta, so sine theta d theta over two, and then the second contribution from phi, which is d phi over two pi. So the four pi here has been separated into two times two pi. That just helps the the math work out a little bit uh, cleaner when you do the integrals. So um, the approach is the same as the inverse transform method sh shown on the previous slides. So here on the bottom, uh, we've done a change of variables uh, for mu equals cosine theta to make things a little bit easier. Um, but mu, our cosine theta variable comes out to two times our first random number minus one. And then the second uh, sampling for our phi random variable comes out to two pi times the second random number. So um, in this way, if we sample two independent random numbers, xi1 and xi2, um, we can use those following these expressions to sample our two uh, subangles, theta and phi. And then with that, we can, we can define our unit vector omega down here as a function of theta and phi. Okay, so we have our source. We've sampled position we've sampled energy, we've sampled direction. Our source is now entering this lab. So the question now becomes, how far does this neutron travel in this lab prior to having a collision? So this uh, physics is governed by the exponential e to the minus uh, sigma r, where sigma is the total cross section in the medium. Um, the sigma outside here uh, shows up because of normalization, because again, we need this as a PDF to integrate to one. So P of R dr is e to the minus sigma r times sigma times dr. So from our PDF, we confirm that it's normalized and then we take that PDF and apply again the inverse transform method to uh, set up our sampling. So we take the integral, so zero from zero to r of our PDF, it comes out to this one minus e to the minus sigma r. And by setting that equal to random variable, solve for r, you can arrive at this relationship here. So the distance r, uh, lowercase r, which is the 
distance and a randomly sampled distance where the Thanushan will travel is equal to minus one over sigma times the log of one minus psi. Um, if you look at this up in any textbook, you're going to find the relationship here on the right, which is r equals minus one over sigma times the log of psi. So one minus psi has been replaced by psi. Um, the reason that can be done is because uh, the random number psi is uniformly distributed on zero and one. Therefore, one minus psi is also uniform on zero to one. So making this replacement uh, allows the sampling to be done with one fewer uh, calculations. So there's no need to take one minus a random variable because they're both going to be uniformly distributed on zero to one. So that's why this relationship on the left here with the one minus get, always gets replaced with the simpler version of log random, oh, negative log random over the total cross section. Um, just a word if about um, if we were to consider a medium that were two different, uh, sorry, a uh, slab that are two different mediums. You could um, do this as a combination of, of the two uh, cross sections and the two mediums. So um, if the distance took you out of the first material into the next one, you would do a combination of the two. So the first, the first slab would be um, characterized by cross section sigma one, and the second slab will be characterized by cross section sigma two if the distance capital R is the distance from the position to the edge of the boundary. So um, kind of a detail, but this is the way that you can do this calculation if you have um, successive slabs of different materials. Okay, so our source has now traveled some distance r, and now uh, we need to figure out what type of interaction the uh, neutron has once it arrives there. So um, this sampling is done using the cross-section data. So the cross-section data are nuclear data that define reaction probabilities for any set of possible reactions. So you can see the example here on the slide, sigma total equal sigma n plus sigma n prime plus sigma gamma, so on and so forth. These are not an exhaustive list, but you know many possible interactions that a neutron could have. Um, we can think of these cross sections as each as individual discrete probabilities for the given interaction. So if we uh, consider this list of cross sections as a discrete PDF, we need to normalize it. So um, the second line here shows the normalization process. So we take to arrive at lowercase p of x, which is our PDF, we have to take the sum of all the cross section data and divide it by the total cross section, uh, thereby um, getting a partial probability for each of these interaction types. Um, so the, inter the probability of any collision type x is p sub x, and you define that as sigma x, so the sigma for that reaction type divided by, divided by the total cross section. And we can use these partial probabilities to create a step function or a discrete uh, PDF from which we can sample and um, define the, uh, the collision type. Similar to the, the rolling, the, it's similar to roll, the rolling a dice uh, Monte Carlo example, if, if, you've, if you've seen that one. So um, here's a kind of a cartoon of how, how it would work. So um, here's our, our probabilities. So P, the P sub X is, so P of N is the elastic scatter probability. Um, P N prime is the inelastic scatter probability. So P N plus P N prime. And so the Y axis here is just a successive sum of all of the different um, reaction types that are that are available to this neutron and we so eventually when you've added up all the probabilities this axis will terminate at one uh, once you've summed all the partial probabilities you're going to arrive at the total which we've um, assured is one through our normalization so by setting that y-axis also equal to a random number we can sample that distribution so um, the random number gets sampled between zero and one and and you look and see which band it falls in. So if a random number is between zero and PN, we would say that that neutron had an elastic scatter event. If the random number is between PN and PN plus PN prime, we would say that that neutron has an inelastic scatter event, so on and so forth. Um, so it becomes a discrete sampling approach where you check the value of the random and see which band it falls in and that band defines the type of interaction that the neutron has. Um, 
One of the assumptions we made when we set up the problem statement in the beginning was that all scattering was isotropic. So in the event that the um, reaction type we sample is a scattering event, we would then need to define the direction, the next direction of travel of our neutron. And we would do that in the exact same way um, that, I, that I showed the source isotropic angular sampling a few slides back. Um, same exact sampling approach would apply to get the new direction of the particle. If the particle gets absorbed, obviously that's the end of the history and we would, we would tally one in our absorption count. Um, otherwise, we need to pick a new direction. And from that new direction, we would pick a new distance of travel, so on and so forth, until uh, the particle either absorbed, gets absorbed, or escapes through one of the two faces of our uh, one-dimensional slab. So how do we tally um, in MCMP? So um, MCMP, in Monte Carlo, excuse me. Um, in Monte Carlo, whenever you're computing a flux or a reaction rate or a current, um, that's referred to as a tally. And it's referred to as a tally because of the way that um, it's done in, in Monte Carlo. So you're, uh, you find that yourself literally adding up contributions, whether it's to a flux or a collision density or a current. Um, in a real experiment, if you could zoom in and watch the neutron, um, watch its path, watch this random walk unfold uh, with your eyes, you could, you could think about counting the number of collisions in a certain volume and, and that would allow you to estimate a collision density or a flux. Um, that's exactly what gets done in Monte Carlo codes. So you could think of this region D as some region of interest where you want to score, if you want the reaction rate in there, for example. Um, and what the Monte Carlo code does is, is take, take account, take a tally of the different events that happen in that region D. And I'm going to talk about the, the three common ways that that gets done in Monte Carlo codes, a collision density, track length, and plane crossing methods. Just a word about uh, angular flux and flux and current. Um, flux is a scalar quantity, and you can think of it as the total distance traveled by all particles in a certain unit volume. Um, so in Monte Carlo, we typically tally that as track length. So it's the total path length traveled in a volume normalized by, normalized by that volume, and that, that gives the units of uh, particles per centimeter squared per second. Uh, current is the number of particles crossing a, surf, crossing a surface per second per area. So it also has the same units as, as flux, um, but it's a surface property or surface um, quantity, uh, unlike flux, which is average over a volume. And that's important because um, depending on what you're trying to calculate, the Monte Carlo will, will kind of approach that in two, two different ways. So Along those lines, if, uh, if you're trying to tally current in Monte Carlo, the appropriate thing to do there would be a surface crossing estimator, meaning you would wanna count the number of particles that cross a certain surface. If you're trying to tally flux, which again is averaged over that volume, uh, there are many ways that one can do it. Um, track length estimator, collision estimator are, are the two um, most common. It can also be done with surface crossing, but that's not, not really uh, too common. Um, reaction rates can be uh, calculated by using any flux tally, so any, any flux estimator that you choose to use, multiplied by the relevant cross-section. So flux times cross-section is by definition reaction rate. Energy deposition can be, can be arrived at by, again, any of the flux estimators multiplied by the appropriate energy, energy deposition factors. So um, the moral of the story here is the flux estimator is really king in Monte Carlo codes. If you have an accurate flux, flux estimator, you can go from that flux estimator to things like reaction rates, energy deposition, dose, um, so on and so forth. So flux estimator really is what you want to spend the most, the most time on. So um, first we'll talk about surface crossing though, because it's, it's the most straightforward. Um, surface crossing scoring in Monte Carlo is, is done exactly how it sounds. So it's looking at a surface, in this case labeled delta S, and we're looking at how many particles cross that surface. Okay, we may give some consideration to the angle of those particles. We may not care about the angle. Um, in this case, we're showing kind of a J plus J minus situation where we're looking at particles that 
enter and exit or across the surface on different sides. Um, but essentially what, it, what the estimator does is it adds up the, uh, the weight, which I haven't really talked about yet today, um, but it adds up the weight of all particles crossing that surface, divides by the area of that surface, divides by the weight of the source, and divides by the number of particles that were sampled. So every Monte Carlo estimator is going to divide by the number of particles that were sampled. So you're essentially arriving at a probability for any of these estimators. Um, the area is important just to get that one over centimeter squared type units. And the weight is kind of the seventh property of the neutron in, in MCMP. The, the weight is a property that Monte Carlo codes use to um, allow the user to um, perform techniques called variance reduction. So what, what you can do in Monte Carlo codes, because you're controlling the random sampling, you can bias that sampling intentionally to improve your own statistics. But if, if that's done, the weight of the particle needs to be uh, reduced or increased to account for that intentional bias of the, of the sampling. So for this discussion, we're going to assume that the weight of all particles equals one, which means we're not doing any kind of uh, biasing to our sampling. Um, the weight everywhere is one. The particles are born at weight one, and the particle's weight stays at one for its entire life. So in this relationship, that's known as analog Monte Carlo. So in this relationship, for analog Monte Carlo, W sub i is, is one, and W zero is also one because the particles are born with weight one, and the particle's weight remains at one. So this tally simplifies to just the sum of one. So you're adding one every time the part, any particle track crosses that boundary. And that's the surface crossing, surface crossing estimator. Track length scoring is uh, similar in some ways. Uh, in unlike the surface crossing, we're no longer looking at a surface, we're looking at a region in space. Uh, it's drawn here as a 2D region in space, but you can think of it as a 3D uh, region of space. Um, what we do is we look at particle tracks that, that cross that region of space and we look at the length of that track in that region of space. And that track length in our volume is what gets scored um, by the Monte Carlo. In fact, it's the product of that track length times the particle weight. But again, if we're assuming analog, this WI goes to one, W0 also goes to one. So the track length estimator becomes the sum of the track lengths in that volume divided by that volume, again, divided by the number of histories that were simulated. Um, so the, the second example here uh, show if the, this kind of thing happens where a particle comes in, collides, and um, kind of changes direction, this entire track length would get added together. So the, the length of this first ray, D1, plus the length of the second ray, D2, um, you're adding up all those small segments to get the total path traveled of particles in that boundary, which gives us our estimate of particle flux. You can also count collisions in, uh, in Monte Carlo as, the, as a way to estimate flux. Um, the same idea as the um, surface crossing type where you're just summing the weight contribution. So at every collision point in the volume, you're looking at the weight of the particle at that collision. Again, if we're in analog mode, these weights are always one. So you're just summing one. Uh, because we are doing a collision estimator, this estimator gets weighted by the total cross section in the medium. It's inside the sum here because it depends on energy. Um, but this is one over centimeters, which uh, cancels one of these centimeters to give you the inverse area units that you would expect from particle flux. OK, so I do have a slide here um, just you know, comparing and contrasting what we mean by analog and weighted uh, Monte Carlo. So again, analog Monte Carlo means that the weights of all particles are born unity and they remain unity uh, throughout um, their lifetime. So the bottom bullet here is what I was saying. When you're um, tallying these particles, the score is one whenever, the, whenever that particle is tallied. Um, because they're what we call, we're doing faithful simulation of the particle histories, which means we're not doing any alteration of the PDFs. There's no biasing. Uh, we're sampling from distributions that are true to the physics. We're using e to the minus sigma x. We're not doing any, any playing any games. If the particles get absorbed, they're killed. They're, the, tran the transport is stopped. Um, things like that, which means our sampling is as true to the physics as, as, we, as we can make it. <clears throat> 
In the second category, for weighted Monte Carlo, that doesn't isn't necessarily true. So um, we can alter the PDFs to favor events of interest, meaning we can we can make it so uh, when particles are absorbed, they're not actually killed. We can let them continue in the transport, um, which is obviously unphysical. But if we adjust the weight to account for that unphysical bias, um, we can preserve the average tally result at the end. So um, that's what weighted Monte Carlo is in a nutshell. You don't have time to go into it today. Um, but suffice to say, for weighted Monte Carlo, the weights um, are born with weight one sometimes. You can actually have them born with any weight you want. Um, but the important point is that the weight is altered throughout the transport. So the weight is not necessarily one when the particles get tallied. So in analog Monte Carlo, you're scoring one when the particle scores. In weighted Monte Carlo, you're scoring the weight when the, when the particle scores. That's, the, that's kind of the point here. Okay, so in summary, um, the life of neutrons or photons is random. Um, just kind of repeating what I said here at the beginning of the lecture that um, at the beginning of the particle's life, there's a probability that it's born with any certain number of properties, location, direction, energy, all these are random. And we can, we can think of them as random and we can sample them as random if we know the appropriate physical distributions. Uh, flight distance in a medium from collision to collision is random. Um, if the particle scatters, the direction that the particle will travel after that scatter is random. Any secondary particles that get produced through absorption or fission or otherwise, also random. Um, so ultimately, um, the process by which the random walk ends, whether it's absorption or transmission or reflection or something else, um, all of that ultimately is random. And through knowledge of the physical um, physical laws that govern those processes and random sampling, we can, um, we can model that random walk using Monte Carlo. So why use Monte Carlo? Um, it's, it's a powerful tool. It can, it can be used to represent complex geometries of real systems as they exist. Um, unlike deterministic approaches where um, homogenization is often required, uh, in Monte Carlo we can treat um, situations as close to reality as possible. We can use pointwise cross-section data. We don't need to homogenize geometry. Um, so we can get a, a really accurate numerical experiment of what's going on um, in the physics. Of course, the downside of that is it, it can be a bit expensive computationally in terms of data and also time, um, but that's, that's the price you pay for the, the extra uh, accuracy of the method. You can also use it to um, perform efficient numerical integration. So if you have some multidimensional problem that you can't or don't want to integrate by hand, um, you can use the Monte Carlo method to, to um, integrate that for you. I didn't show any examples here, but I think Mike showed a couple in this morning's lecture. So if you missed that, I believe the video is, is already online. And uh, point three, it, it's also, as, I, as kind of related to point one, it's a, it can be a means to do an efficient numerical experiment. So if you um, can't get into the lab or you don't have the means to perform the same experiment hundreds of times to see what happens. You can do all that in Monte Carlo. Um, and if it can provide a way to, um, to optimize and design things where numerous experimental trials are not um, possible or not feasible. Um, it can also used, it's also used commonly to, as a validation for deterministic methods. So because the Monte Carlo approach is, is so true to the physics and the geometry, of the of the real experiment, it's often used as kind of a baseline uh, validation method when experimental data are not available. So with that, just want to acknowledge a couple of references here. These top two are, are textbooks that I, I highly recommend if, if you're looking to do some more reading. Uh, the bottom two bullets are just, you know, of course, I've seen many lectures on Monte Carlo and I've benefited from many instructors that have come before me. So I just wanted to acknowledge a couple of folks that um, were influential in, in creating these uh, slide materials. So uh, with that, that will conclude the lecture and I'm more than happy to uh, take any questions. If anyone has questions, either uh, put them in the chat or use the uh, raise hand feature and um, we can address them that way.
Okay, I don't see any uh, raised hands or questions in the chat. So uh, I'm gonna thank you all for your attention. These slides and the recording of this lecture will be made available in the next couple of days. Um, a question just popped up about uh, GADRAS. Uh, it's a very detailed question. Um, I don't know too much about GADRAS, but I know it's a, it's a 1D, it's a 1D um, tool used to, to simulate uh, gamma transport. So unfortunately, I'm not quite equipped to answer that question uh, right now. Um, another question in the chat, is there a practical limit to the number of weights you can assign? Um, not really to the number of weights. Um, there is a practical limit to the value of the weight. Um, because the, the tally contribution is equal to the weight, in, in a situation where the, the weight value becomes extremely small, uh, what can happen is you end up spending a lot of computational time uh, model, tracking a particle who will that, that will contribute you know, a very, very small amount to the tally. So you can imagine a case where the weight becomes 10 to the minus, you know, six, seven, whatever. Um, eventually, it's just not practical in terms of the computational time to track particles whose weight um, ends up to be so small. So there are techniques in a typical commercial Monte Carlo codes that allow you to uh, track weights and make cuts on weights um, to make sure that the computational time is being spent um, where it needs to be spent and not tracking particles that um, do not contribute meaningfully to the tally. Okay, great. Well, thanks for, thanks for those questions. I really appreciate it. And again, um, this lecture will be online um, probably in the next day or so, and we'll, we'll put the slides in the Google Drive as well. So thank you all and uh, have a nice day.